Max, Bob, great to see you again. Yeah, thanks for having us. No, oh, thanks for thanks for joining us for an exciting discussion on all things air to water and hydronics. So I know it's going to be a, a great conversation, and I certainly appreciate your collaboration and you joining me for this. Uh, I think everybody knows who everybody is, but we'll do a quick introduction for any new faces. Uh, my name is Michael. I am the technical services manager slash trainer for Eden Energy. I've been involved in hydronic heat pumps now for two decades. When I started, there was no gray in this, and now I've, I've got some gray here. So, uh, you know, obviously very passionate about heat pumps, very passionate about hydronics, and I'm excited to do this training today. Max, tell a little bit, everybody a little bit about yourself. Sure. So I'm the uh, education and industry engagement manager at Kalefi. So I do a lot of work with training and, and marketing and then also trade groups like Ashray and Aspi and things like that behind the scenes with Kalefi. And yeah, I've worked in the hydronics industry for uh, for a very long time. <laughs> so Bob, pretend people don't know who you are and just give us a quick summary of who you are. <laughs> Yeah, I guess I've been with Cluffy almost 15 or maybe it's 15 years now. So before that, I was a contractor. I had two different businesses, one in Utah, and then uh, we moved to Missouri for 20-some years, and I started a business there, and now we're back in Utah as of two years ago. So uh, I still tinker. I don't know if you can see any of the stuff behind me in my, my own shop and from friends and family and stuff, but uh, pretty much full-time training with Cluffy. So thanks for inviting me. Yeah, no, I'm glad you could make it. You you actually were in Ontario, and hilariously, we never managed to connect. Just our schedules didn't work, so we've, we've done it virtually. Yeah, that was a couple of weeks ago. It was nice to be up there. So I, I grew up in Buffalo, New York, so just across the uh, lake or river, whatever way you go down there. So familiar with that territory. We used to vacation up there all the time when I, when I grew up in Buffalo. So it's changed a lot, though, I'll say that. Yeah, it's uh, it's an ever-growing situation here in Canada. One of my American friends referred to us as the attic of the United States. I didn't know if that was a compliment or an insult. Well, certainly a lot of cranes swinging up there, so there must be some business <laughs> going on. One of the uh, the sales guys that I worked with, uh, Ray Howe, uh, lived in Minneapolis, Minneapolis, and he called you guys the uh, our neighbors to the south, because just like that, <laughs> peninsula of Ontario is a little bit lower than him. So uh, we have a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. We, we do have a PowerPoint presentation we're going to go through, but anybody who sat through my training or any of the training that Max and Bob and I have done together, because this is not the first one, uh, the point of this is to make it as interactive as possible. Uh, so in the chat window, please ask whatever questions you have, whether they pertain to air to water or otherwise. I mean, we, we're here to answer questions, so ask away. We'll do everything we can to help you. Um, the other thing that's worth noting is we do have a few fun handouts for you. Uh, so I'm going to explain one of the handouts. One of the handouts that you've got is actually the new brochure for the Advantage Air to Water heat pump. This is a cold climate heat pump that comes in a three and a five ton uh, capacity. This training is brand neutral, but we are going to talk a little bit about that unit because it plays well into what we're doing here. So you can certainly download that. And then Max, do you want to just sort of walk through the two Kalefi handouts we have for everybody? Yep, so we've got the two hydronics issues that are probably most related to what we're talking about today, and we probably have a few screen grabs from each of those sprinkled throughout. So hydronics 27 was about air-to-water heat pumps, so that's another nice brand neutral way to look at the science behind heat pumps and proper applications. And then number 30, hydronics 30, is low energy building. So just how do we make the building itself the best version of itself with uh, with hydronics and uh, a lot of different topics covered there. So two of my favorite issues and uh, a good fit for the conversation today if you want to do some further reading. Yeah. So the other thing that we did want to note is obviously we talked about questions. Ask questions whenever we'll address those. The other thing is we're going to extend a couple of interesting discounts to everybody who's joined us today for this training. So just by showing up, we're going to extend a 5% discount on your next Kalefi order. We don't really care what that order looks like. The only thing that we're going to ask for you to get that 5% is we want you guys to share some cool stuff with us. Uh, so you can reach out to me personally, either on Instagram or on LinkedIn. It's pretty easy to find me, Michael Riddler. My, my name's on the slide. Just send us a cool installation photo that incorporates some Kalefi product. Uh, if that product also happens to incorporate some IBC product, you're going to get a personal use IBC boiler. Uh, so that's a pretty nice hefty little deal to make that happen. So 
spread that around your teams reach out to me on linkedin reach out to me on uh, instagram obviously follow bob and max on instagram as well they like to share some cool stuff but if you're looking for the promos, send them over to me, and uh, we look forward to getting you guys doing some more Coleffi and, and obviously some IBC products as well. So as we dive into this presentation, we, we want to talk on some of the keys to making sure that you actually have a winning hydronic heat pump installation. So the reason I'm referring to a hydronic heat pump installation versus an air-to-water installation is because what we're doing here is going to also apply to water-to-water -water equipment. So if you're a, a water furnace dealer or a client master dealer and you're doing water to water equipment, then everything we're gonna talk about here would apply. Um, obviously, anything that we say here is quite generic. So if you have very specific product questions, reach out to me afterwards. Don't start applying generic concepts to equipment you've never worked on before. You know, make, make sure you do know what you're doing before you dive into it. So biggest thing I like to always reinforce and Max and Bob can speak to this as well is boilers are not heat pumps, do not pipe a heat pump like you would a boiler. They have different requirements for flow rates, they have different pressure drops, they have different delta Ts. If you do in fact pipe a heat pump like a boiler, uh, you're gonna get a lot of experience because it's gonna fail and you're gonna have to redo it. And hopefully when you redo it, uh, you'll pipe it accordingly and everything will go smoothly. The other thing that's important to touch on is buffer tanks and, and Bob's gonna talk about this in one of the slides, but buffer tanks on heat pumps are a must. You know, there's a few manufacturers out there that don't need buffer tanks on their air to waters. And we had a, a conversation before this webinar started where we've got a lot of questions. Uh, good news is these manufacturers want our feedback. So the three of us are gonna give them some and we're all gonna get a lot smarter for it. But buffer tanks are very critical to heat pumps. And we're gonna talk about why in this presentation. Again, flow rates, pipe sizing, all different. And Max is gonna talk about that and I'm gonna touch on it a little bit. Um, and the other thing that we gotta talk about, which should be intuitive is there has been some feedback that air to waters are you know a little bit more money than boilers so we don't know if they're going to get adopted there's a big difference between an air to water and a boiler in that the boiler only does heating and air to water does heating and cooling so we do have to say that because it does get overlooked that people don't understand you're doing both in one it also helps us from a design standpoint because in the past we've had to do boilers and then do vrf or standalone air handlers with cooling you know, we now have a complete packaged unit that you as a hydronics installer designer can now achieve the goals you need to. The other thing that comes into play here, and again, Max is gonna talk about this, is design is absolutely critical. Hydronic heat pumps are not something where you go to a job site with 15 different boxes and then kind of figure out how it all goes together. The reality is warranty does not cover ID 10T errors. And, you know, if you, if you read that closely, you'll realize what I'm saying there, much politer than it's written, you know, read the manual. It's, it's very, very important. You know, Bob and, and Max are chuckling because they understand that both of them are great guys, but they can't warranty things because we didn't do it right. We, we do have to make sure we work off of a design. The other thing to keep in mind is that air to waters work at different water temperatures. And again, we're gonna dive into this. So be aware of that. Uh, you are a little bit uh, hampered in water temperatures, but the reality is if you're following good design practice, again, not just showing up with 16 boxes and figuring it out on site, if you have a design, then this isn't a concern for you. You're not gonna have to worry about these water temperatures. And then the last thing that we wanna just touch on is just the fact that you really do need to think about your designs and future-proof them. In Canada, and Max is gonna talk a little bit about the United States, because it's important for us to know what our, our brothers and sisters in the States are doing. In Canada, come 2050, we're gonna be 100% net zero. There is gonna be no gas appliances, there's not gonna be any gas boilers. And so what we do right now, even if we're doing boilers right now, we need to make sure we're designing those systems around future-proofing it. So we still have the ability to do boilers, but we have to make sure that we install them in such a way that in 10 years, when it needs to be a heat pump, it can be just a straight re and reinstallation. So. Max, why don't you give us a, a quick little rundown of what's happening over in the States? Sure, and then just to your last point there too, one of the, and I don't know what the exact number is, but when we get to 2050, we're not building everything again in 2049. Most of, you know, 80% of the buildings we're gonna be dealing with have already been built, won't even be built between now and, and that time. So a big part of this conversation is how do we make the existing stock better 
uh, we're not starting over. This isn't a tear down Canada, tear down the United States and build, you know, all anew today. It, it won't happen. So, you know, where do we go from there? So I'll go through a couple terms um, that relate to the this big picture discussion first. So down in the States as well, electrification in a few key markets has become a pretty big deal. So in uh, New York City and in the Bay Area, they're saying in the Bay Area, they're saying we're not going to bring natural gas to specific cities. It's more city by city, unlike Canada, where it's you know nationwide. But they're substituting direct combustion for uh, non-electricity, you know, substituting electricity for something that would have been a gas in a pipeline or in a tank. So pretty high level, pretty simple for. A homeowner to understand that maybe that means that the diesel bus or natural gas bus that used to stop outside of my house in you know San Francisco isn't going to be there anymore. Uh, we're taking that off of the table. That also applies to the mechanical room, so no more stacks coming out of the top of a building. That's going to be a carbon, a decarbonized building, uh, a decarbonized building, <laughs> and that's one of the things that I like to talk about a little bit here because. An example in Washington, D.C. is that they're saying we want to decarbonize Washington, D.C. by 2040, 2050. I forget what their number is. Um, that could just mean that we're going to build a new coal power plant in West Virginia. <laughs> that, that doesn't mean anything's better. It just means that the carbon is being burnt somewhere else. Instead of having natural gas inside of my house, we have coal right next to somebody else's house, and that's a decarbonized DC. So, you know, it's just uh, throwing it over the fence uh, in some uh, scenarios. So, uh, the next bullet point um, gets to another piece that's interesting. So, zero emissions, you know, all of these things overlap. It's kind of like one of those Venn diagrams with the, the three dots. All of these things overlap so far. Zero emissions could, again, mean that there's no stack, there's no products of combustion coming out of the top of my building. Does that mean there's zero emissions in the grid? Absolutely not yet. Maybe one day everything near Salt Lake City would be wind and solar and uh, vibranium and fusion or whatever, hopefully. I, I don't think that that will be the case uh, in the short term. Uh, so zero emissions is, is something that's really building or city or zip code specific now. The last bullet point I think is the most complicated because it is balancing the scales. So we could say a zero energy building is electrified, it's decarbonized, it also has to use a small amount of energy. Another kind of critique of that Washington DC decarbonization policy is I was at a national meeting in the uh, national capital chapter and somebody raised their hand when they were doing kind of a description of this and they're like, just rough math here, there's not enough roof space in the District of Columbia to balance the scales. There's not wind here. There's not, you know, a uh, Niagara Falls that we can use running through DC. <laughs> There's, uh, they've done some creative things and some cool things like using energy from uh, the sewers, uh, but it's a small square of a city. You know, the District of Columbia is not as big as Manhattan. It's not as big as Chicago or Ontario or you know Toronto. So the biggest thing here is that we have to greatly reduce the amount of energy we need to heat the buildings. And that's where I think the three of us can help here. We can't determine if they upgrade the grid or where they put the solar panels you know, in my region or in Ontario or in Canada as individuals. But I think that we can, and collectively the people on this call, make the buildings use less energy to keep us comfortable. That's something that, that is in our wheelhouse. So I think it's interesting, Max. I was not fully up to speed on what NRE was doing in the States, but here in Canada, because it is a national approach, uh, there won't be any, like in Ontario, we're just going to dump all our bad habits in Alberta. Like yeah. that, No, that's uh, what we do. Yeah, that's, uh, that's what US awesome. thing for sure. <laughs> you know, and, and the other thing I think that is important is that not just the three of us, but, you know, the 70 plus people joining us today is that we have an opportunity to introduce to the stakeholders some opportunities on how we can go carbon neutral uh, without getting into anything too crazy. You know, like geothermal is a great way to go carbon neutral. It's very viable. You know, solar thermal, which Bob is very passionate about, is another option. And there's air to water. Bob, do you have any other thoughts before we move on on other things we could do as part of this whole carbon neutral discussion? Well, I mean, I always say the best money you can spend is lowering the load in your building. I mean. 
you know, before you even consider replacing a boiler with a heat pump or something like that, figure out how to make the building as good. So that's money that comes back to you for the length of that building's life, basically. So get your loads down, get your building as efficient as it can be, then design your system because it's going to look a lot different if you can, you know, take a big bite out of the uh, the load of the building. And I think it was issue number 25, Max, that we talk about um, reducing the supply temperature and water temperature yeah you know, water temperature in existing buildings so if you have a building with fin tube that was you know designed at 180 degrees now what are you going to do so there are tricks that can be done but uh, do that in conjunction with lowering the load on the building upgrading the insulation or the windows perhaps something to get the number as low as possible and then you know then start doing your heating and cooling design yeah great comment totally agree okay so i've got a proposal for you and for anyone on the call here. So uh, we lived in Springfield, Missouri for a long time. My dad lived there for 25 years. I lived there through uh, middle school and high school. There is a rock under Springfield, Missouri that's like the size of the, the a third of the city. It's this enormous limestone rock, a single, single huge chunk of limestone that they mined for a lot of years. So it's this big hollow rock. At some point they're like, hey, this thing's big enough, we can drive a train into it. And then at some point they said, oh, we've got a bunch of empty spaces here. Why don't we just rent these to people? So now there are a bunch of cold food storage things in here, servers. It's you know allegedly one of the places that they would take the president if he were flying <laughs> over uh, because you, know, you could have a big earthquake and it would just kind of shift, but it wouldn't you know, break or it wouldn't collapse. So the cool thing about it is it's like 65 degrees Fahrenheit in there all winter, all summer. It's always the same temperature. So this is what I would like to propose to everybody on the call where we're all gonna move. So everybody, we're going here, we're gonna move in here, we're gonna have our houses in this rock, we're gonna you know, take the train or take a, an 18 wheeler down the street and work there. Uh, we're all, all going back underground, Who who's with me? You can type into the, the chat or the questions if, if you're joining me on my uh, pilgrimage to Missouri to get into the Springfield underground. But what I think is the next click here. I think that as a people, we want to live in this building. So this is a building that I think it's like 180 riverfront in Chicago. So similar, you know, right on the lake, right on the river in Chicago. This building is a kind of an interesting construction. They had a small footprint available on this lot because they still needed to maintain the bike path. So this is a radiator. This is what I would call a radiator. This is a big glass box up on stilts in the windiest, coldest part of Chicago. This is the exact polar opposite of a cave. <laughs> this is something you would build to dissipate heat. And this is the construction that we love. You know, the skyline of uh, the GTA is going to look like this as well. We love big glass buildings. We like to be able to see all the sunlight. There are a lot of things that pull us in that direction. This is a much harder path to zero energy. We could do everything to the absolute best of our abilities, you know, to what Michael said, with the technology that we have already, we're not looking for some sort of, you know, Hail Mary pie in the sky technology here. Uh, this is still a tall task. You would need uh, a really well insulated building. Uh, this is going to be a hard place to start. <laughs> so uh, whatever we can do to reduce the loads that are given to us by an architect, uh, it, the better. Um, but that's kind of what we need to find some sort of middle ground here to build zero energy buildings. To add to that from a retrofit standpoint too, Max, is a lot of people, me included, get a little bit of sticker shock of I'd like to reduce my loads, but I'm just going to make some numbers up here. So let's say that to reduce my overall loads is $10,000, right? So we look at that number and go insulation or a, a, some new windows is 10 grand. We don't do that because we look at what our utility bill is and go, I don't see a return on investment. Yeah. But in Canada, at least, with the carbon tax, it's a significant increase that's happening each and every single year. Yeah. So any of you that gets a gas bill has probably noticed in the last two years that your gas bill has increased dramatically. And it's, it's not all about fuel costs. It's about that carbon tax. And it's going to continue yeah. to grow. So those upfront changes that you make that Bob was talking about, yeah, they're going to cost you now, but they're going to start to pay significant dividends over time. It does now. We've gotten to that point where it makes sense to pay the ten grand and save two hundred dollars a month for the life of the system that you've put into the house or the commercial building. Yeah. 
So there was, a, you know, in the earlier days of Radiant and Hydronics, kind of an us versus them approach that if we were going to build a, a Radiant house in Park City, Utah, up in the mountains, uh, you wouldn't have used cooling at that point. It wasn't really something that everybody was doing. And it was, no, you don't need a furnace. You would just do radiant heat in here and you'll be really comfortable. But at the time, the buildings were leaky enough and there was enough infiltration that there was just kind of natural ventilation, <laughs> not managed by anything, just the buildings were leaky enough. Uh, that won't meet the building codes anymore in the U.S., or in Canada. So we need to move some air through a building. You know, commercial buildings for sure have tighter standards, kind of as described on the bottom with ASHRAE standards 90.1, 55 for thermal comfort, and then 62.1 for commercial ventilation standards. We have to move some air around the building. So it isn't like we can just say, we're only doing hydronics, we're not moving any forced air. People want cooling. We need to get the stale air out of there. That's just the reality that we live with. But I think that the hybrid systems that we can build with the best of both are kind of the future of addressing these sensible and latent loads the most effective way and leveraging air moving around for its strength, which is dealing with the humidity, lowering the latent loads, dealing with that. And then hydronics is really great at the sensible loads. And we can combine those two to make a really ideal system that we could move to a zero energy future with. Yeah, and in Canada, we're seeing the national building code starting to, uh, I don't know how to word it quite delicately, but SB10 and SB12 are now sort of getting set aside so that the national building code actually sets the standard across the country. And we certainly have a lot of really good engineers and designers and feel free to throw something in the chat box for us to clear this up, but it's gonna help with standardizing what the expectations are as we move forward as to how we should design these places to make sure, because as Dr. Allison Bales likes to say, uh, you know, a, a house needs to breathe or, or does it? You know, there's a lot that comes into play here and having a clear and concise code structure really is important to that. So as we sort of move along here, some things that we have to pay attention to as we talk about air to water design or frankly, hydronic heat pump design that plays into what Max is saying is if we go and put this into a leaky house, you know, traditionally we'd go through a boiler in there and you know, that boiler, the smallest boiler you can buy is typically about 100,000 BTUs. And, and most houses, including older homes at 100,000 BTUs, you're not gonna have any problem heating that house. So the, the rules of thumb where you hold three fingers up and it covers the house and you go it's a three ton or you know, there's all these crazy methods they use, we can't do that anymore. We have to be very conscious of the things that are gonna impact that unit. Those of you doing air source heat pumps already know this, that we have to be conscious of the outdoor temperature. So with an air to water unit, we have to be aware that as that outdoor temperature increases or decreases, it's impacting multiple things. So specifically what it's doing is it's impacting the overall capacity of that unit, depending on what the outdoor air temperature is. It's also impacting the capabilities of that unit and what it can produce from a water temperature standpoint. The other really important thing that comes into play is the COP will be impacted, not just by the outdoor air temperature, but also by our design. So we can't control the outdoor air temperature, but we can control the design. And again, this is where Bob and Max and I are really hitting on this point that we wanna make sure we design the systems to maximize that coefficient of performance for that equipment. You don't wanna go and put a brand new air to water heat pump in or any hydronic heat pump and inadvertently give them an electric furnace. We wanna make sure we design this properly that we are maximizing the efficiency. And then the other things that comes into play is we need to design around the defrost cycle. And I don't mean to be over dramatic in that, but we have to be aware there is a defrost cycle and that defrost cycle is going to be quite significant. Max is gonna talk about it. So we need to make sure we're aware of that and understand what's happening during that defrost cycle and how could that impact our ability to heat the space. The good news is in a hydronic system, it's gonna be not as serious as it might be in another system because we've got things in play, including a buffer tank. They will give us a buffer of energy that when the outdoor unit is in defrost, we don't need to worry about it so much. But this is again, why all three of us are pushing aggressively for buffer tanks in some, in some cases against what some manufacturers are saying, because we're not coming at this from an engineering perspective. We're coming at this from a nuts and bolts application standpoint, because all three of us, we do design work now, but we all worked in the field. We all installed equipment. And I'm sure Bob can attest, we all have learned the hard way in some scenarios. So we wanna make sure, and I'm gonna quote my friend Chris 
uh, from Mitsubishi on this, is we want to make sure we design the hydronic system around the heat pump's parameters instead of trying to fit it into the system. And you'll see this a lot with boilers. We'll take out a non-condensing boiler and we'll just fit that condensing boiler in there and it'll typically run. But, you know, Siggy likes to always point out there's a distinction between running and working. And if you're putting condensing boilers in and you're only getting six, seven years out of them or even 10 years out of them, there's some larger questions to ask of, are we actually designing that system or are we just, you know, dropping it in place and making it work? Bob, do you have any thoughts or comments to add to this as we move along? Yeah, no, that makes sense. I mean, there is a an argument to be made for mod cons, even on high temperature systems, just from the modulation standpoint. And I've been putting some uh, information out on heating help on that. If you run the uh, the runtime and the cycle efficiency of the cast iron boiler and you've got uh, micro loads on it, you're probably running that boiler more into 70% efficiency, so 80. So when you look at those two numbers, even if the mod con was running at 160, 180 degrees, still going to be more efficient than the cast iron boiler that can't modulate down in its short cycles on micro load. So getting off the heat uh, pump a little bit, but just know that it's 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 more about the cycle efficiency than it is the uh, the efficiency number on the side of the boiler whether it's a cast iron or mod con but we'll talk about that another time maybe yeah well you make a great point bob i mean the fact that, that appliance is 96 percent there's a whole variety of things like what is the firing rate what is the return water temperature there's yeah. more in play in the field that impacts that efficiency and the difference with a heat pump is that it's not just a matter of impacting efficiency you are dramatically impacting the life of that equipment. You you can yeah. kill a piece of equipment in six months by not piping it properly or designing it properly, whereas the boiler that Bob is talking about, it might last seven or eight years and nobody will know better. So we definitely need to try to plan and accommodate around what a heat pump can and, and cannot do. So, you know, as, as we look at it, we always want to make sure we have a design first approach when it comes to air to water equipment. Again, don't try to pigeonhole something into something it shouldn't do. Uh, an air to water unit can be incredibly efficient, but it depends on did we actually work from a design. We just go to site, drop everything on there and try and figure it out. You're a really good installer, you can get through it. But the reality is a design build application is gonna be more cost effective because you're not wasting hours on site trying to figure out how it's all gonna go together, regardless of skill level. Like you, all three of us would go to job sites with a design. You know, maybe some exceptions in our own homes where we're tinkering. Bob and Max and I have, you know, you can see Bob's behind them. We like to tinker and play, but as a general rule, you want to work off of a design. The other thing is that when we talk about hydraulic heat pumps, it's not an all or nothing proposition. There, there is a great case for hybrid applications, and Max talked about this. You know, you can put an air to water heat pump in, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with having a solar thermal backup, an electric boiler backup, or even having a gas boiler backup. In a retrofit application, which Max talked about, there are gonna be scenarios where you simply cannot meet the load of this old building doing an air to water. But the reality is if you do an air to water in a small electric boiler or a small propane or whatever fuel you choose as backup, we can meet those loads, we can still have an excellent performance on that equipment, and it will actually reduce the overall cost of doing that retrofit. And then the other thing we need to look at, and again, Bob and Max have already touched on this, is pay attention to the actual envelope of the building. Don't just look at the mechanical room and what you're doing there. It is good to actually go through the process of having an audit done. I just had an energy audit done by building knowledge at my house, and that was before I put my air to water in. I wanted to know, are there things I can do? And holy smokes, there was a lot of really easy things I could do in my house. My house was built in the 80s. It, it leaks like a cheese grater, and you'd be amazed all the little things you can do for a couple of hundred bucks uh, they can really reduce the envelope. So it's that conversation of pay a little bit more now to pay less every single month. And in 20 or 30 years or even five or 10 years, you'll start to see a return on dividends from doing so. And I think yeah. a blower a blower door test is probably the most important yeah. thing you can do for because infiltration can be a huge number on a heat load. And we estimate it most of the time. Most of the people don't know what the infiltration of their building is. But I'll tell you, if you've ever done a blower door test, we lived in an older house too, Michael. And it's, I mean, you go around with that smoke pen and it was outside. <laughs> the smoke that you just did, it, how did the guy, you didn't even know where it went outside. So that's something that I don't know what they charge to have that done up there. I'm sure it depends on the size of the building, perhaps, but that can tell you a lot about where your where your energy is going through, uh, you know, what we call infiltration instead of just the the cold temperature difference between inside and outside. So I haven't had building knowledge back yet. A couple of them are on the call here, so they can sort of comment on my house. I'm sure it's not the worst they ever seen, but uh, I had the equivalent to like a barn door in my house. Yeah, uh, yeah that's open door. That's what <laughs> I did too. Yeah. 
yeah. you know, a big part of that fix of, of having that blower door test done and having professionals come in, like we could muddle our way through it, but bring professionals in just like we expect with our industry. You know, little things like just putting, you know, four dollars worth of weather stripping around the giant gaps in my windows. Yeah. During the blower door test, it sounded like somebody was playing a violin in my house, and that was the wind going through my windows, right? Yeah, so yeah. don't automatically assume you're looking at ten thousand dollars for upgrades. For me, it was a hundred bucks. I mean, I'm gonna do more, but a hundred dollars worth of weather stripping makes makes a big difference. Well, so. or just spray foam around your rim joists if you have a basement or a crawl space. That's a huge, you know, that wood shrinks over time. And I've been in houses where you can look outside through the the rim joist to the foundation connection. So. Yeah. I didn't know you'd been in my house, Bob, but you're describing it. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of houses, probably. Most of the houses. All so right. one of the things that this is a, a slide that we've had in hydronics a bunch of different times and, and something that John Siegenthaler talks about a lot, but I always love this graphic that just if we're going to take a step back and look at the sensible loads in a building, why is water a good fit? So if we just look at the, you know, the physics answer to that question and look at the bottom right of the screen there, the heat capacity of different materials. So water versus air, water is going to be able to carry about 3,500 times as much energy in the same volume. And that's important for a few different reasons, because just if you're an architect looking at this slide, we're going to move the same amount of sensible heat with a three quarter inch piece of PEX versus a 14 by eight inch duct. That's a big upgrade there. That's aesthetically going to be, you know, nicer. We can squeeze that into a few more places. Uh, it's going to be easier to do all that, and it just is—it's the best way to move that sensible energy around. Again, not talking about latent loads here. Just the sensible energy is a good fit to, you know, the conveyor belt is better with water than it is for air, as uh, as uh, Dan Hollihan mentions as well. So to that point, Max, my my own house is is fully finished, and I just put an air to water in. My my main floor, my upstairs, is horrendous. Like it doesn't cool well, it doesn't heat well. Some of the products you're going to talk about later with the low H2O, it's very easy for me to run a piece of half inch PEX from my basement yeah. up into my attic, and then distribute that out to convectors to take care of the space. If I had to run new ductwork, I mean, just cost alone, it, it just doesn't make any sense. I'd be making a giant mess throughout my house, whereas half-inch packs you can hide behind a crown molding. It's it's very easy yeah. to do. So this is, I think, the kind of best case scenario of a hybrid system example would be a radiant cooling uh, system. And again, this is for commercial new construction. Adding radiant cooling to an old leaky house in Missouri is probably a bad idea for a variety of reasons. You don't have the envelope, you don't have the control system, uh, you're not really set up for success, but new construction, commercial, the building codes, the ASHRAE standards that would apply to that already kind of check the boxes of some of the prerequisites that you would need to do radiant cooling, so it sets you up in, in a good way. So the graphic on the left would be an all-air way to do the latent and the sensible loads. So you're going to take all of the energy out of the room, go through the coil and uh, you know bring it back a little bit cooler. In this scenario, we've got a little bit bigger duct work because we have to deal with 100% of the latent and the sensible. So on the right there, you know, it's gonna be different with every job site, but what if we could just soak some of that sensible energy, that radiant energy from you know, the, the warm person's body that radiates in line of sight in all directions. What if we could just soak some of that into the floor, pull that out, or radiant ceilings, or you know, whatever you might use in a building, and then we're just dealing with 100% of the latent load and a fraction of the sensible load with the coil in that case. So this is a nice example of conceptually what a hybrid system would look like. You allow the radiant to be the one that's you know carrying more of the weight with a sensible load and then you're still dealing with effectively the latent load with the the a coil there so that's essentially what you would do to have kind of a split hybrid radiant cooling system and you know maintain the the best of everything now one of the things that's worth just mentioning here the thing that terrifies me the most would be somebody telling me that they're going to apply what you just said into an existing hydronic system so let's say i've got my house from the 80s I've got radiant tubing throughout, and Bob, I'm going to fill chilled water through that slab. Why don't you just walk through why that's terrifying? 
Yeah, I mean, it's all about the loads. You know, it, it starts with that math on the load numbers on that. But, you know, it's a dew point. Once you get temperatures down to where the, the air starts to sweat on everything, that's not going to be a very pleasant or acceptable condition. So you've got a very small window there, what you can do with, uh, you know, with radiant surfaces. You know, maybe the... Um, some of the ceiling stuff's a little bit better. I know some of those um, chilled beams actually have little pans under them. So if they do drip or sweat a little bit, they can collect that and get rid of it. But yeah, you, you don't want a wet, clammy floor. So you're going to be limited on that on that load that you can carry with that. So One of the things with radiant cooling too that makes it really efficient is that we're not cooling water down to 33 degrees Fahrenheit to circulate through the building. You know, it might be 55, 58 degree that we're moving around, which makes the the work that the chiller or the air to water heat pump or water to water heat pump have to do uh, less work to get the water that cold. And then that helps us stay away from the, the dew point uh, as well as one of the factors. There are a lot of levers that you have to pull there, but that's, that's yeah, kind of and one of the difference. One of the things we have to design around. So even if we take the scenario, we'll say we've gotten Bob to design a system for us. Everything's <laughs> great on paper. He's figured out all the temperatures we're going to operate at. You have to not forget that you have an end user. And I'm going to use a real world scenario that happened last summer. We designed a system with three hydronic heat pumps in it, uh, doing heating and cooling. All the design parameters were great. Everything worked good for most of the summer. And then the contractor called and said, we're having equipment issues. And the equipment issue was not an equipment issue. It was a end user issue. What had happened was they didn't like the temperature. They read something on Dr. Google and went, well, I'm just going to turn it from 50 degree chilled water to 40 degree chilled water. Um, you know, that introduces a whole host of issues, not just what it could do to the floor or the walls, but what is that going to do to that piece of equipment when you drive that water temperature down and start to overload that compressor? And it, it is a big problem we have to be aware of. So part of that design process is make sure that your design is designed in such a way that regardless of what the homeowner does or the building owner does, that they can't hurt the system. Because at the end of the day, they're still gonna make it your responsibility, regardless of what happened there. In this case, fortunately, this end user was great. Uh, I spoke to them directly and took the contractor out of it and said, hey, uh, what have you done recently? He said, oh, I, I decided to turn it down. Great, let's put it back to where I left it and I bet you everything will go back to normal. But what happens if you don't get that phone call and they let it stay like that for a few years? Well, as Bob just articulated so finely, you're gonna have a serious problem with construction damage. And it's called the performance envelope or that piece of equipment. I think we showed that in that one hydronics again in the generic form. It wasn't a specific brand of equipment, but it shows, you know, with a color graph where you want to be running that equipment. If you get outside of that performance envelope, yeah, the equipment's not gonna be happy or healthy. So yeah, you're going to end up with low pressure, high pressure lockouts. Like we're not going to get into that today. There's lots of other training courses where we, we do dive into that, but you're going to seriously harm that unit. If if that unit had in fact been left at those temperatures, the compressor would have failed and it would not have been pretty. Those of you who work on hydraulic heat pumps know the last thing you want to do is kill a compressor. It's it's like putting sugar in the engine of your car. Like it's it's not something we want to be doing if we can help it. So we're going to talk about two different options here. We've got a whole bunch of mechanical drawings we're going to just sort of discuss between the three of us. But there's two options right now that are on the market on Ontario. And this particular unit uh, is the IBC 5-ton air-to-water heat pump. And this is a packaged outdoor unit with no indoor unit. So immediately when you have no indoor unit, it is technically less expensive on paper. And I have on paper intentionally because again, now you as the installer or you as the engineer designer have to figure out how to pipe this thing. Now, if it's just a boiler, it's not that big of a deal. It's, it's pretty easy to get done, but we have to remember this is a heating and cooling appliance and we need to make sure that we're not putting chilled water, heated water into places that it shouldn't be going. And there is quite a bit of piping and controls knowledge that needs to be there. So on paper, less money, but I'm here to tell you that if you don't understand this technology, this is not a cheaper solution. So really important that you collaborate with the right partner, manufacturer, wholesaler. Make sure you have that support structure as you do your first few because all three of us will be honest with you and say that we've done our first and we've done it wrong. We're just honest about it. A lot of people won't be honest to say they've, they've done it incorrectly because you just don't know what you don't know. Sometimes you learn the hard way. So there's a little bit more knowledge required to do a piece of equipment like this. Uh, and so obviously there's a higher potential for mistakes. Um, we want to make sure we pay attention. 
having an, a single outdoor unit with no indoor unit, again, on paper, can be a little bit easier for multi-unit installations. But again, the number one thing that's going to dictate whether the equipment installation is successful has nothing to do with the equipment. It has to do with you. If you are a very capable installer, you've been to a lot of training and you have a great manufacturing partner, you're going to do wonderful things. Just understand that, again, we don't want to try to pigeonhole this into the application. We need to design to make sure the heat pump will, in fact, fit that application. The other option that you have is you would have what's called a packaged indoor-outdoor unit. So this comes in a three-ton and a five-ton unit. This is called the Advantage unit. The outdoor unit I'm not showing here because it looks quite similar to the IBC one that you just saw. Um, the difference between these two units is it has a fully packaged indoor unit. So on paper, this is more money. But again, it's, it's on paper. The reality is this could be an easier installation for you because what you end up doing is you literally just mount this indoor unit on the wall. It has hook up your outdoor unit, two ports that are clearly labeled. It has your heating and cooling connections clearly labeled and it has your domestic hot water op connections clearly labeled. You don't need any extra pumps. You don't need any diverting valves. You don't need any controls. This is a fully packaged solution. So if we did a quick cost comparison, I'm gonna throw some contractor cost numbers out. If we said that the IBC unit would be somewhere in like the nine to $10,000 range, this Advantage unit might be in the 12 to $15,000 range, but understand what you're getting with that. This is a fully packaged completed unit. Uh, so it, it it's not truly making an apples to apples comparison, but both would be great solutions. It just comes down to what makes more sense for you. One of the nice things about this unit is you have less chance of having equipment failure because you're not going out there and figuring out how to pipe it. It's it's literally a prepackaged unit. You install it. It, it comes pre-configured, which is pretty nice. Um, it could maybe not be ideal for multi-unit applications because again, all the controls are packaged into the indoor. This particular unit, I can tell you, this is the unit that Eden Energy has in stock. We stock them in three and five tons, and we can make this work in a multi-unit application, but there certainly are people who can't. So just, again, be conscious of what the capabilities are. What I really like about this, and I say this with full respect to everybody, is this equipment does not require engineering by contractor. No good, and no good contractors want to be engineers or pretend to be any more than engineers want to pretend to be contractors. So... The picture that we have here is actually the installation in John Siegenthaler's place. Um, so this is a, a pretty simple installation. It has a, a TurboMax installed here on the right-hand side that's taking care of the domestic hot water. And then we can actually see where the heating loads are, are going out to the building uh, to take care of heating as well as cooling options throughout. Uh, and you'll, you'll notice that there is a, a digital feeder on this because again, uh, we had an off-camera discussion about glycol uh, there's no scenario where the three of us don't want to see glycol in a system where you could have chilled water uh, or better yet be feeding water into an unconditioned space. The unconditioned space in this case would be the outdoor air to water unit. We don't want water going out there that's unchilled. Um, Bob, looking at this photo, any thoughts or comments? I know you've probably seen this many times. We're both good friends with John. Yeah, no, this, I mean, and this system's up and running, so we're getting some history on how it in fact works in a climate probably similar to uh, Europe climate. This is uh, upstate New York, so this is a good uh, test bed for uh, how all those components work together, the hydro separator and the, you know, the radiant tubing. I think there were some, maybe some panel radiators in there. I don't remember exactly, but this was his son's system, I think. Was it or his daughter's? I don't remember. He's got, I know he's got three different systems running now, so um, yeah, I mean, insulation is key in this, and it's a good job there, nice and tight everywhere. Um, Inverted manifolds, I like those. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think that the big takeaway here for everybody to think about is we all refer to Siggy as the go. Like he is, when it comes to hydronics, he, he's the guy we all, you know, consider a friend and mentor. If John Siegenthaler is putting a packaged indoor-outdoor unit in, you need to think about that, right? Like John is more than capable of designing his own system, but he has opted to do the outdoor-indoor unit because he understands the value of doing so. Any thoughts to add to that, Max? I would. One of the other things that's interesting about this is that the cooling side is just a coil and you know forced air. So the the cooling side is is very simple compared to probably what we would have you know sold in the past. This isn't like radiant cooling with a residence with a bunch of you know chilled beams or ceiling panels or anything like that. This is just 
cold water through a coil that we're blowing air across to do residential cooling, uh, which is nice because that, that brings it back into reality for a house. We can't put a, a million dollar mechanical room into a four bedroom house. It's just not, that's not, we're not gonna be competitive there. So this I think is a, a cool system because it's the, the best of hydronics and then just a very straightforward, simple cooling that's appropriate for houses. Yeah, I totally agree. In my own house, uh, you know, I'm doing the exact same thing. I'm going to be using an air handler uh, for the cooling side of it. And I'm actually retrofitting radiant walls into the rooms in my house that need it because I've got hardwood carpet. I don't want to be paying for that. And drywall's cheap. And as you guys all know, we can deliver way more BTUs out of a wall than we can out of a floor. And from a thermal comfort standpoint, it doesn't make a difference. People wrongly, some people wrongly think it has to be the floor. You're not going to be comfortable. Uh, if you're sitting around a fire, a fire outside, you don't care where you're sitting. As long as the fire's there, you're warm, the hydronic heating system is, is the same conversation. So, um, yeah, uh, it's a really nice installation. And again, just take away from this that Siggy's more than capable of building this indoor unit, and uh, he definitely didn't. So we're going to hand this one over to Bob. And so what Bob's going to do here is he's just going to have a little bit of a discussion. We'll maybe start from the outdoor unit. And Bob, do you want to just sort of talk about some of these things and we'll we'll add some color commentary on what we're seeing and, and why these different things are important. And maybe we'll just start with the really easy, we've got the outdoor unit and how do we install that outdoor unit? Yeah, I mean, not, I, I'll be honest, I haven't installed one. I wish I had one here in my shop and I'm working on getting one, but that part I don't know a lot about, but certainly the hydronics and what connects A to B, I can, I can speak to that. So... Uh, I mean, it's going to be piped like a typical hydronic system. We want to have air removal. We want to have dirt removal. We want to have a good purge point where we can get a good flow through that to get um, get all the big air out so that the air separators can do their work. Uh, spring check valve, not a swing check valve. Always want to use a spring check valve on hydronic applications. That picture actually shows what looks like a combination air and dirt on the top. And then we've got another dirt separator on the other side where we've got the flat plate heat exchanger. So we've got two different fluids working here. We've got the flat plate heat exchanger. Uh, that's a separate system with its own pump, its own separator, and uh, it would have an expansion tank too. So uh, what else can I talk about there? Uh, expansion tank size properly, of course. Um, yeah, I mean, I think all the right components in the right position here, pumping away from the expansion tank on the bottom there. So we're adding that delta P going out to the um, the heat pump, um, maybe a webstone so idea, fill and purge. Yeah, the secondary heat exchanger, the reason that you're seeing this in here is because the idea being is if you've got a large buffer tank inside, you don't want to fill that buffer tank with glycol if you can help yeah. it. This, that's, that's the sole purpose of this. If you had no buffer tank, you could glycol charge the whole thing and have no heat exchanger. The whole thing. Yeah, and that that's a good point too because um, when I worked in Colorado, in a scenario like this, you know, it depends on how cold it is where you live, but maybe you have 40% glycol on the left side and you have 20 on the other. I mean, below 20, people weren't crazy about either, but um, or in this scenario, we're showing water filled on the right and then glycol on the left. The least percentage-wise glycol that we need, the better, because then we don't have to upsize our pumps. And you know, the, the only thing that we like about glycol is that it doesn't freeze. So it's not fun to get air out of or you know to deal with in a system. Uh, and the flat plate right there lets you say, okay, we're just doing the heavy load of glycol on the left. And then on the right, we're doing water because we're in Toronto or you know, if we're further north, then we're going to do a, a lower percentage of glycol for the, the rest of the system so that blue pump on the, the right side may come down a size or two, which would be great. Yeah, and a lot of the units where they have a packaged outdoor indoor unit, you have to be aware that the indoor unit typically has a built-in pump. Like the one that is installed in John Siegenthaler's house that Eden Energy is distributing, uh, it's got an integrated pump. So you have to pay attention to that. It, it is a good pump. Sort of touching on some of the things for Bob, because I have installed a few of these. So key things to keep in mind is that this unit outside, we're showing it here on, you know, just sitting on a pad. Um, be aware that depending on your climate, this isn't a good idea. So if you go back to the photo of mine, this is this is just a general photo that Kalefi is using. We need to be above the snow level. So you need to make sure it's on a snow stand. In my case, I actually mounted off the wall with just a giant stand. Uh, typically, you want about 18 inches uh, of clearance for your snow stand. Uh, those of you in, uh, I know Lee is on this call and she's in, in northern Ontario, even 18 inches, she's still going to have snow issues, but we want to make sure it's up. The other thing we got to pay attention to is the defrost cycle. 
So when this unit does defrost, we want to make sure that we don't just have that, you know, sticking out over the edge of the unit, unless your intention was to put a skating rink beside your house. Uh, if you're right next to your neighbor, you may also have a skating rink followed up with a lawsuit. So we need to, we need to make sure we pay attention to that. Uh, make sure we have good separation between the actual house and the outside wall. We want to have good air movement through that unit, just like with any air source heat pump. And then the other thing that's worth noting is these right here. So these are stainless steel connections, and, and depending on uh, braided hose stainless steel connections, depending on what jurisdiction in, they'll serve a different purpose. Like I'm sure in California, they'll want these for earthquakes and other things. Uh, we want to see them everywhere because we don't want you running PEX tubing directly to a compressor bearing unit. Uh, what will happen is that if the pump ever failed, uh, this unit could still be running, the water could become stagnant, flash to steam, and then psh, we, uh, we rupture the piping. So it gives us that flexibility, it eliminates the noise issues, um, which is the other thing is as the compressor's running, this will not allow vibration to come back into the house and, and sort of cause any noise. So, but I, I feel like we did a pretty good job walking through that. Anything that comes to mind, Max, that we might not have uh, touched on? No, I don't think so. I think that's a good description to start with. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. So just sort of a, a quick discussion of, of how a heat pump works. And again, this would apply to an air to water or a water to water. We're not going to get super detailed here because we do a separate course on this. We're actually doing it in two weeks. But the idea behind this is that in the heating mode with an air to water or any sort of water to water or air source appliance, we're extracting energy from the outside. So we're actually extracting energy. We're going to put that through a compressor circuit. And what happens is we're then taking that superheated vapor and putting it into the house. So where you see Bob or Max or myself talking about the fact that this unit has a COP of three, what that means is that we're actually getting 36,000 BTUs from the outdoor air and we're bringing that in through the compressor circuit and we're then dumping that heat into the house. Now, where some people get confused because I get a lot of emails because we have a lot of content online so people watch it or read it and then reach out is you, you can't do this without a compressor. It's not just a matter of we're moving water outside, moving water inside. There's a compressor section, section that's coming into play here. And so the heat of extraction is just literally taking energy from outside and, and bringing it into the space. And as Max alluded to, the fact that we're using water works to our advantage because we can get 3,500 times the amount of energy out of water that we could be doing if it was air because of the specific heat of, uh, of water itself. Now we're in the cooling mood, it's, it's the exact same thing. The easy analogy here is your refrigerator. When you put food in your refrigerator, if you put your hand behind the fridge, you'll feel the heat being rejected from the food into your house. So you actually have a, a, a small radiator in your house in the summertime. Um, it's the same principle here. So in the heat of, a, heat of rejection, what we're doing is we're dumping the energy from the house and the energy from the compressor outside. And, and then of course that is what is cooling down the space. So, it's not anything too crazy. The, the technology is you know, not anything that's brand new. The only thing that's changed and where we're seeing this with whether it's air source or air to water is that with vapor injection technology on a vapor injected 410 or 454B refrigerant system, we can now run those units down to lower water temperatures and achieve higher capacities and, and, uh, and better performance even in Canadian climates where it gets incredibly cold. So. That's in a nutshell how the system works. If you want to know more, as I say, we have a separate course where we get really detailed in how the vapor injection works, how the reversing valve, diverting valve, domestic hot water to superheater. But for the purpose of this, we just wanted to touch very, very lightly on this. So Max, why don't you walk us through a little bit about COP and what, what that means in the design water temperatures? So the thing that all of the, it's funny how different manufacturers show this information, but the the higher we're trying to lift water with anything, with a boiler, a condensing boiler, a solar panel, a heat pump, whatever it is, if you're trying to take water up to 140 degrees in, in this graphic, uh, the efficiency of that appliance is, is going to suffer. So in COP, uh, if we're moving 95 degree Fahrenheit water around to heat everything, we're going to see the best version, the you know the LeBron James of performance of that equipment. <laughs> if uh, if we're trying to run that thing out to 145 degrees to go through some undersized uh, fin tube baseboard that's all covered in you know dog hair or something like that in the building, 
at a best case, the efficiency is going to go way down that we're getting closer to electric resistance heat, which is using a very expensive piece of equipment to do something that it, it shouldn't. That's really not what it's designed for. So when you see with boilers, AFUE on the side, that's assuming that you're doing everything to kind of the, the peak of that chart. And that's the same thing with heat pumps, that if we want to have these heat pumps shine, we need to be using the, the lowest temperature water to do the distribution in the, the building. And uh, that's how you're going to see the COP creep back up. A COP of, of one is just electric resistance heat at that point. And that's the last thing that we want to do is install a heat pump that's giving you the same return on the energy dollar as a, an electric resistance element inside of a you know, water heater tank or something like that. We don't want to go down to that number. Yeah, so as we sort of walk through that whole discussion, in, in my own home, my unit's 57,300 BTUs, but because it's near to water equipment, I can't say it's always 57,300 BTUs. It depends on what is the outdoor air temperature, and it also depends what am I trying to make that unit do. So just to sort of segue a little bit, that's where a water-to-water -water heat pump is superior. If you put a five-ton water-to-water heat pump in, the reality is it's always a five-ton unit. The ground temperature is stable and constant. It doesn't matter where you are in Canada or the United States. Somebody will dream up a spot in Alaska. But the reality is there's geosystems and research facilities in Alaska that, again, are, are heating the space. I don't know if they're doing cooling, but heating the space just fine. So we need to be totally aware of what we're doing with the equipment and just to truly understand what it means as we increase that water temperature. So if Max designs a system around 95 degree water, he's going to have a COP that's in excess of four. If I go in with no design, the conversation of having 12 boxes and just slapping them on the wall, well, if I'm running that thing at 140, the reality is that unit might have an advertised COP of five at 57,000 BTUs. I've in inadvertently turned it into a 20,000 BTU unit and my COP might be one and a half. And you know what you're gonna end up happening is somebody's gonna call you in January and say, why am I freezing? Like it's, it's simply not heating the house because we didn't design it around the right temperatures. The last thing you want to do is put in a heat pump, which is going to be more money than a boiler and it inadvertently give them something that should be 400% efficient, a COP of four, that in fact has a COP of one and a half or two. And as a guy who's done this for two decades, I unfortunately do have to go to jobs and have that difficult conversation of there's nothing wrong with the piece of equipment. It's, it's everything around it. Bob, anything to add to that? No, that's, uh, it's all about the design. We keep saying that a lot of different ways, but there's no way around it. Yeah, we, we need to be very focused on design. We have to understand that things are changing. You know, I, I, some of my family members have been in this trade for a very, very long time, as, as has Bob. And, you know, some of them don't like training. And I always make the joke with them, like, you know, we've been to the moon and now we're going to Mars. Like, things have changed. You really should come to training and, and get up to speed. The attitude of I've done this for two decades and don't need to learn anything. Well, I've done this for two decades and I do training every week. Max does training and I don't mean teaching. I mean learning. We get out and we learn stuff. Bob learns stuff. And, you know, it's really important that we be aware that things are changing. If we don't pay attention, it's going to be a penalty that you don't want to deal with. It's going to be very expensive, the end outcome, if we don't do things the right way. So one of the things we just sort of wanted to show really quickly is that the way that a lot of these equipments are able to produce these different temperatures and, and specifically higher temperatures at lower operating temperatures. So you can see that on a vapor injected, and here we're talking about that advantage unit or the IBC unit, on a vapor injected system, even down to minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit, we can still produce 130 degree water. So there's a lot of capabilities here, but again, back to Max's point and Bob's point, if we don't need 130 degree water, if we can creep that back to 100 or 95 degree water, the overall capacity of that equipment and the overall efficiency of that equipment goes up. So those of you who are designing your systems around the envelope first, you are always going to have the most efficient heat pump. And the other thing that comes into play is you're going to be the company that has the heat pumps the last 20 years, not five years, not four years. Anytime that we try to push a piece of equipment outside of this black line here, so Hopefully you can see my mouse. If I try to drive it up here to 140 degrees, I push that compressor outside of its envelope. What that means is I'm gonna be bouncing this unit off high head. And the analogy that I like to use is it'd be like, we just got Max a lottery ticket and he went and bought a Maserati and he drives it like he just got a Maserati going from stop sign to stop sign by just flooring it. So he's gonna need a new engine very quickly. 
Whereas Bob would drive that Maserati nice and slow and responsible, right, Bob? You wouldn't speed. <laughs> it wouldn't be a Maserati, but. <laughs> <laughs> Me neither, man. I'm not even sure if I could pick a Maserati out if I got asked to, but you get the analogy. We want heat pumps to be treated that way. We want to drive it like we're driving Miss Daisy, if anybody gets that analogy. Like, just, just drive casually, drive slowly. The best heat pump installation is one that turns on in October and just runs low and slow and doesn't shut off till April. You know, fully modulating piece of equipment. And frankly, Bob would tell you, and so would Max, the same applies with a boiler. Yeah. You know, if we, if we had a boiler that was just sat on low fire and ran all the time, we wouldn't care. If it's on high fire running all the time, we, we know you've got a problem. But low modulation is, is really critical in this equipment and uh, very important. So the other thing I have here is I just wanted everybody to see, because certainly there are scenarios where we're seeing manufacturers saying, hey, yeah, we, we've got a vapor injected unit that can produce 160 degree water. Uh, even if it can produce 160 degree water, we're going to ask, why are you doing that? Your COP is going to be terrible. This is actually an operating table for 410 on a vapor injected air to water or water to water, both would be the same boat. And you can see that if we get above about 143 degrees, we are now outside of that safety buffer for that compressor. So, you know, again, look out for yourself, look out for your installations, don't design these, even if this was 150, I would again ask, why are you redlining this appliance? Whatever this number is, don't go near it. You'll see that the supply temperature we're specifying is 130, right? So anything within this red box here would be more ideal. The more we can bring that water temperature back, it's, it's not just all about efficiency here, it's also about is the piece of equipment gonna last? As we bring those temperatures back, it's gonna have a much longer life than if we don't. So we talked a little bit about defrost mode. There is two different types of defrost. So Max, why don't you just sort of walk us through passive and, and active defrost? So passive is kind of the easy one. And if it's below you know, 39 degrees Fahrenheit, we turn on a fan, we keep some air moving around outside. It's just a little bit of electricity through the fan that we're going to keep some air flow across the outdoor unit. The uh, On the next slide, the active, we're actually taking water that we have warmed in the buffer tank and we're taking it back outside to heat it up a little bit. It's not going to be you know every second of the day below 37.4 degrees Fahrenheit outside or anything like that, but we are taking water that we've heated to go outside and make sure that that doesn't turn into a big ice box outside. Uh, one of the things that my dad was mentioning that is a, a nuance here is we're taking water that we heated, hopefully, with a COP of three or four to do that. In older versions of air to water heat pumps, you might have electric resistance to keep it from freezing, but you're talking about a COP of one at that point. So you're using just an electric water heater to make sure that thing doesn't freeze outside. Now, instead, we can use water from our buffer tank potentially that we've heated with that higher COP just for a minute to keep sure, to make sure it doesn't freeze up. Uh, so that's getting better. I think that that's one of the critiques of uh, air to water heat pumps in general is like, why would you put the machinery outside that you have to keep from frosting over that you're, you know, it's outside where it might be cold and you're making it colder. Like that seems like a, a bad idea, but this defrost has gotten so much better and you're not just throwing it all out the window and running electric resistance to keep it from freezing all winter. Like you, you may have been doing even just a, a decade or so ago with air to water heat pumps outside with a monoblock. So the key thing that Max said there that we that I just want to really touch on is he just told you the buffer tank is part of your defrost cycle. So the buffer tank in this case is serving more purposes than just you know trying to stabilize your load when your equipment capacity is different from what your actual building draw is. The other thing that will caution, and we all know this, but I just want to say it out loud, is that every manufacturer has a different defrost cycle. So if you were to look at Spaceback, IBC, and the Advantage unit, all three of them utilize different methods for defrost. So don't just assume that the buffer tank is how your defrost cycle is being used. In the case of the Advantage unit, it actually has all the defrost logic built into that indoor unit. You don't need a buffer tank to do defrost. It doesn't even use it. You need to know that. But again, that's where at the very beginning where we touched on, make sure you pick a good brand, a good supply partner so that they can help you educate you. You could in fact throw a 80 gallon buffer tank into a job where you don't need a buffer tank. Now, those scenarios are pretty slim, but you obviously want to be aware of that as we move along. So 
We touched on this a little bit. A lot of people sort of go, well, it's great that Max keeps telling me to drive my water temperature down. That's that's just not achievable. And again, so this photo was supplied to me by a good friend of mine, Curtis at Nautilusaga Mechanical. And it's a, a real world scenario where, you know, he was faced with how do I get the water temperature down? So we showed him. And Curtis is the kind of guy that he loves knowledge. So the only thing that we changed is we actually changed the tube spacing from 12 inch to six inch spacing. And we drove that supply temperature from 120 degrees to 109 degrees. Now, overall on COP, your COP just went through the roof. It doesn't matter whether it's a boiler, your boiler efficiency is going to improve. Everything gets better regardless. But what we did here was we just increased tubing. And the one thing that we all know is the least expensive part of the system is the plastic pipe, right? So for us to put in six inch versus 12 inch spacing, that's maybe $300 worth of pipe. But what does that mean every single month? If you just knocked 50, 60, $70 off their utility bill every single month for the life of that equipment, that's a big difference. We need to make sure that we're paying attention to that as we're going forward. Any thoughts on that, Max? And what was the spacing that we did in, in your shop? We do six or nine inch and in... yeah, six inch. Yeah, I, I mean it doesn't need that. If you looked at you know a, like a warehouse garage example, if you put it into LoopCAD with one of the manufacturers or something, it might say now twelve or eighteen is fine. But to go with the lowest temperature, you know it's it's going to be faster responding. It's going to be really comfortable if you're in there. You know, not that you're in there with bare feet in the shop, but uh, it's a good fit. And it just is one of those things that I used to work for Ray House, so I used to you know get paid to tell people to use more PEX. I don't anymore, and I would still love to tell you to use more PEX because it's just an investment in your utility bills. Uh, do that tighter spacing. It's it's better for a lot of different reasons, and it it really just allows you to creep this graphic right here you're just creeping up your efficiency again if you can get uh, more energy into that slab at a lower temperature because you've got more surface area you've got more pecs in there to you know to conduct to the rest of the concrete and radiate into the space it's just uh it's money well worth it and it just the the pecs is such a minimally uh you know expensive thing in that whole house you know much less the hydronic system just uh, just go for it and go with the tighter spacing and if, yeah, it was a, the, if it was a sorry. foreign slab, another thing that helps a lot is the uh, getting the tube up into the slab. Yeah. If you can keep that tube two inches from the surface instead of at the bottom of the four inch, that's going to cost you about 12 to 15 degrees more supply water temperature if your tube is at the very bottom of the slab as opposed to up in the slab. So if you use a six inch and it took time, but we raised everything, I don't know if you can see the slab behind me, we raised it up on little chairs to get that um, tubing up. Uh, six inch on six inch works pretty good because the mesh that we used was six inch so every every strip had a tube on it and then we lifted it up and got it up near the the surface and that got me down to that lowest possible line on that graph for supply water temperature so if and when i do get a heat pump someday i'm i'm at that uh, sweet spot for you know running that with a heat pump instead of the boiler maybe you can see behind me here i'm going to help you take care of that bob i'm going to get you a heat pump you know what so i want there's one that I, I saw years ago and I just looked it up this morning. Somebody was asking me, it's a company in the UK makes one called a Kenza and it's called the um, Shoebox Heat Pump. They make a three and a six KW heat pump. And honest to God, it's no bigger than a shoe pump. And it's a, it's a geo heat pump. And you put it right under your kitchen sink and you take a loop field out wherever you are in, in the UK, I guess. And uh, that's what I need, something that, that capacity really. So, so but I'll take one whatever of the one of the comments we just got it's a good comment so jason from building knowledge thank you for the comment has pointed out that you know going from 12 inch to six inch spacing does add some challenges and he's specifically looking at head loss so when we go from 12 inch to six inch spacing we actually have to redesign those circuits it's not a matter of just going where i had 12 inch i'm going to do six inch csa b214 helps on this if we actually follow code we'll realize that if it's half inch tubing we can't exceed 300 feet per circuit yeah. The way they came up with that 300 feet wasn't just, you know, a bunch of us got together and said, oh, 300 seems good. As you tighten up that spacing, if your circuits don't shorten, your head loss goes through the roof. So yeah. you do need to make sure you don't just go, hey, I heard Mike say do more pipe. Um, because I have seen, Jason, we had a, a designer many, many years ago um, who, who did not care what I said to him. He did three-eighths tubing as tight as he could, and he had 600-foot circuits. The reality was he couldn't pipe it. There was no way he could pump it. Well, so, you can kind of see the manifold in the background there. So what was the square footage of your shop that 
manifolds bigger than you would expect for a shop that size. Um, so that's how we kept the loop lengths shorter. We needed a little bit more manifold uh, to do that. So we didn't have yeah. two 500 you know, foot half inch loops of PEX wasn't gonna help. Or you can do it, you're just not gonna like the pump size and then that's wasted electrical energy that you know doesn't serve anybody so yeah definitely and you can calculate all those things that in the graphic you showed before it changes the feet ahead that you need to do it at different lengths uh, know that you can model that and still come up with the, the right pump because the pump's just trying to overcome the friction of the the most path of most resistance so that's all you're trying to overcome it's not if you add you know 14 more drops to that manifold if the longest one is still only 200 feet uh, that's what you're sizing the, the pump for, so it doesn't get out of hand with the commercial grade pump that you'd need to overcome that. Yeah, good, you good to, You went past that slide pretty quick, but I noticed the head loss on that example that you showed a couple slides back went through the well, roof so on that. We're, well, yeah, we're having yeah. Such, and that's a trade off. A Didn't uh, change. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah the, the length would change to the same length as the 12 inch example, and then it would come back to that same number. Yeah. So one of the things we're just going to touch on as we keep moving here is we, we want to make sure we don't take too much of everybody's time is the other thing to pay attention to is pipe sizing. So the pipe sizing on air to waters is not the same. So in my own house, I, I put everything in the CAD. Uh, obviously, I have a lot of hydraulic heat pump experience. And then I collaborated with the engineering team that designed the air to water I put in my house. And at the end of the day, my unit is 57,000 BTUs. And the actual flow requirement for that unit is 14 and a half gallons a minute. I'm going to move quickly through this math because we have a totally different training class where we talk about the math. But if this was a boiler, you would be 5.7 gallons a minute on a 20 degree delta T, not 14. Where people go wrong is they assume at 57,000, they've been taught with boilers yeah. that three quarter inch packs, 65,000 BTUs. So they throw a piece of three quarter inch piping on this, and then you immediately kill that air to water or water to water mm -hmm. unit. You can't even put one inch on a six ton air to water unit, but if you put one inch on the equivalent boiler, I mean, that's plenty. You don't even need piping that big for it. So understand that the reason these two things are not the same is because a heat pump doesn't lift the water 20 degrees. When your appliance can't lift the water 20 degrees, it's all math. The math changes. And again, we can spend more time on that in a different training module. Maybe the three of us will get together and we'll nerd out and do some math. But we really just wanted to pump that, plant that seed or pump that seed. Uh, it is totally different in how we are going to pipe these units to make sure that they're not going to fail. And, and not just from a flow rate standpoint, Max, why don't you touch a little bit on the, the pressure drop that we also see in this unit? So the pressure drop with the equipment we've used has gone from like low with the cast iron boiler to high with the water tube to low with the fire tube, again, to, to high with the heat pump. Uh, and nothing's wrong with that. It's just the way that the different equipment works. So you have to make sure that you're going to be able to overcome that. And another reason that you can't just copy and paste or cut and paste a condensing boiler out and put an air to water heat pump monoblock into that same you know, one inch pipe or something like that. Uh, you're not going to have the right piping in the boiler room and you're not going to have the right pump for sure to do that. So there's a little bit bigger picture nothing's broken here it's just the different equipment requires a different circulator to overcome that head loss of the the heat exchange space so one of the things that we see just to touch on this and then i'll hand it over to you bob is typically again look at that previous example where i said 5.7 gallons a minute if it was a boiler i'll just go back one slide if i can i can't uh, this is not that case so they would see six gallons a minute they're used to boilers ah oh, it's only like two feet ahead well, you've got the wrong flow rate by a factor of 100%, and you've also got the wrong head loss by a factor of 300%. Like Whatever you've got there is not going to work, and what's going to happen is you've got what I call a constipated heat pump. And what I mean by that is the BTUs are not leaving the BTU generator, and what happens is as the water temperature goes up, your head pressure goes up, and you end up having equipment failure. Bob? Yeah, I guess the good news on uh, if you do have those high head situations is now with the UCM pumps, you know, we're not using 200 watts anymore to to run a high head pump. You know, we're using maybe 100 watts. So, you know, we can get that out a little bit more efficiently with the UCM technology. So hopefully everybody's embracing those pumps when they when they do these designs, because that's another energy saver. Yeah, 
hundred percent, hundred percent. So as we talk about this, I'm just going to share some symptoms because it's worth everybody knowing. If if I don't pipe a heat pump properly, if I don't work off a design and do it properly, the number one thing that you're going to experience is noise. You're going to know immediately as soon as you start that unit up. You're like, huh? Is it supposed to sound like that? And what's great for me is if a technician calls me or if I'm, I'm collaborating on something, I can tell when they call me whether that heat pump's set up right because I can hear it. If I can hear your heat pump running, I've got concerns about it. The other side effect is if we got noise, then you're next going to tell me is like, hey, Bob, I don't know what's going on with my heat pump, but it's really loud and it keeps starting and stopping. Well, that's you tripping the unit on head pressure, right? It's just it's not delivering the BTUs. It's constipated the units. So we're knocking it off on head pressure. The other symptoms you'll see is the customers will complain. It's not comfortable. They don't have enough hot water. It's not heating the house. You know, they've got high hydro bills and if you don't address this within the first, you know, window of that unit being installed, then you start getting into failures. And typically, it's the electronics that fail first. And again, speaking from two decades of experience, the next thing you're going to tell me is, I don't know what's wrong with this heat pump, but I put 10 capacitors in it. Say, oh, yeah, there's nothing wrong with the heat pump. That compressor is just getting pushed outside of its envelope and the start components are failing because they're not designed to start stop 6,000 times a day. They're supposed to start stop 20 times a day. And then, of course, the, the real doozy is then you end up with a really expensive failure. Anybody who's replaced a fire tube heat exchanger knows that they're not necessarily that difficult to replace, but they're expensive. It's about 80% of the cost of the unit. Well, that $15,000 heat pump, I got a newsflash for you. That compressor is the bulk of the cost. Yeah. Uh, and to replace a compressor and a heat pump, that is not a two-hour job. That is a full-day job. It's not a fun thing to do. And the big thing that we like to drive home here is you're going to have a really irritated end user. That irritated end user is your best sales and marketing tool. And if they don't believe in you or they've lost faith in you, then that's going to mean a, a loss of repeat business. Anything and to add, guys? That too is the, the loss of faith in hydronics, yeah. which we don't want to see go <laughs> either. Because I think there are some people that have lived in hydronic systems that maybe you know, we saw it in, in Colorado sometimes that, you know, second homeowners from Texas would come to town. If they had a bad hydronic system, they would tell everyone they'd ever met how terrible hydronics was back in you know Texas or in other parts of Colorado. And it, it's unfortunate. It's, it's not good for any of us on the call if that's the, the taste left in somebody's mouth. Um, so this uh, this Yaga stuff is some of my favorite stuff in the industry. Um, the, the founder uh, has a book too. He uh, he goes to Burning Man all the time. I think he's like a, a really interesting dude. <laughs> but this uh, this stuff is kind of like uh, the best version of baseboard that you could do. So really low temperature, but also with like little computer fans in there. To, to blow the air around uh, so it's uh you know it's it's doing active convection as well uh, really cool um these trough styles are really nice architecturally uh and they i know that they make a million different versions there are uh, a, a small percentage of those that are going to be easier to get uh into a building just based on the amount of skews there and the colors and things like that that makes the the company really interesting uh, but Great way to go when people are looking to actually you know, do the coolest version of hydronics in a, a space where they've got a lot of glazing, like we talked about with the um, the slide at the beginning. This is not a cave if you've got ceiling uh, to floor glass there, but we still need to heat this space. How do we do it? We can't put a panel radiator in front of a sliding glass door. This little trough is a, a really cool way to do that. And there are some cases that um, you could do, you know, within reason, some uh, you know, chilled water uh, through that as well, since we're additionally moving air across it. But yeah, don't that, don't just replace your baseboard in your house and roll and run chilled water through. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's what we want to drive home. So both of these units, the, the trench rad that uh, that you see there, the nice part is if you have a lot of glass, it's a great way to deliver more BTUs. The, the trench style and the Brisa style on the bottom right, both of those produce usable heat at 95 degrees Fahrenheit. So these products are more money than a traditional panel rad by a factor of about 50%. But again, you've driven the COP of the system so high that for the life of that system, it's going to be very, very cost effective. The other thing is if this was a job, like say we put this into Bob's house and you look at that top picture, let's say the floor is all radiant. Well, how are we cooling that now? Both of these units are designed to do radiant cooling. They have convectors built into them. They have drain pans built into them. 
So literally all you're doing is running a half inch piece of PEX to it. You're gonna run it off a secondary manifold and you're now air conditioning that space in a very simple, easy way to do it. And at that point, you've eliminated the discussion of why are you more money than a panel rad? I'm more money than a panel rad because I produce heat at a much lower water temperature. And by the way, I can also do the air conditioning. So in my own house, I'm actually utilizing both of these products. So the climate canal, I'm putting in areas where I've got a lot of glass, and the breezy unit you see in the bottom, they do look like a panel rad if they're installed in the outside wall. I personally do not like panel rads. I don't know why, I just, I don't want anything on the wall. Um, that particular unit can be recessed into a two by four wall. So it actually comes with a deflector for the top and the bottom. You put in the wall, you drywall over it, you don't even see it. And again, both of those things from a real estate standpoint, recognize that a lot of this is going into high performance homes if you go in for with a solution that can heat and cool and it's a little bit more money and they physically don't see it i guarantee you, you're going to win more jobs so uh the other thing we want to just very very quickly touch on is with air to water heat pumps i talked about it earlier they can't lift the water like a boiler can so we do not want to be putting indirects on heat pumps as a general statement again i'm saying general statement because there's a lot of products out there I've seen the bulk of them. I've been researching air to water heat pumps for a decade because I'm a nerd, just like Max and Bob, we like to read too much. So you want to do a reverse indirect. If you were to looking at doing a, a 65 gallon reverse indirect, like a TurboMax, for example, you could produce up to five gallons a minute continuous at 60,000 BTU. So that that's pretty significant, a draw that you could have on that. But again, you do not want to be doing a heat pump with a domestic hot water load without a design. This is not a matter of, oh, I, I don't think the heat pump's gonna do it, so I'm gonna put an 80 gallon indirect on it. Well, at that point, you've just given them a very expensive indirect that won't work versus a cheaper indirect that won't work. So we've just got this up here. This is a reverse indirect. And so what it is, is it's actually not storing potable water. It's storing the actual heat pump water. Um, but again, we've got other training modules where we touch on this. The big thing is we just want you to understand this is not a standard indirect. Don't put indirects on heat pumps, whether it's a uh, water to water or air to water. Um, Max, again, we have a whole module on buffer tanks. We just want to quickly talk about the purpose of the buffer tank. Yeah, so the, another thing to look at with the formula here is there are different buffer tank formulas depending on the heat source that you're tying to it. So if it's a modulating boiler that's going to go down to you know a 10 to 1 turndown or something like that, you're going to use a different formula than you would for an on-off heat source or something that like an old high-low uh, boiler or something like that. So make sure that you're grabbing the right buffer tank formula. This is something that buffer tank manufacturers will be able to help you out with little calculators that will give the right version of this math there. And then we also have that in, in Idronix. I don't remember what number that is off the top of my head that, that goes through a little bit more detail of how do you know what size it should be. And another factor is how much time. So how much time do you want the equipment to run for? And pick your number there. It's not two minutes. Um, hopefully it's you know 20 minutes or or longer that you would charge it up. But if it's uh, if you go too wild there, it's going to suggest a 500 gallon buffer tank, which you probably don't want to buy either. <laughs> so that's kind of the middle ground. Any thoughts on that, Bob? Yeah, no, that sums it up. There's use the right formula for the for the equipment that you're connecting to it. Because what you'll find is if you have a modulating uh, boiler, heat pump, whatever it might be, the tank gets a lot, lot smaller. So you don't want to, like you say, buy a lot more tank than you need because you didn't size it for the for the low turndown or the lowest load that you're trying to buffer. So yeah, where he's going with this is with a boiler, if it's a if it's a 300,000 BTU boiler, we don't care. We care what is the low fire. We want to make sure we can accommodate for that. In a heat pump situation, we want to also accommodate for micro loads, but Max touched on this. We also want to make sure the heat pump has a minimum runtime of 15 minutes. Now, where does that number come from? It's not from a manufacturer because, again, plug your ears, guys. I know you're with Galefi. We don't care what the manufacturer says. We now want to know what the research says. So in, in the United States, IGSPA has done a lot of research. Here in Canada, OGA has done a lot of research. In the EU, there's a whole plethora of heat pump studies. And sort of the magic number is that 15 minutes. But again, remember what Bob said at the very beginning of this and I repeated and Max repeated, if we can have this equipment run low and slow all the time and never shut off, that's a really efficient functional system. So just make sure you're not applying buffer tank math for boilers to heat pumps because they are a little bit different. 
And then also understand every buffer tank's a little bit different. I love this buffer tank because of how it's piped. I'm not gonna get too crazy in the details, but I've got a buffer tank that acts as a great hydraulic separator. It's perfectly stratified. I know I'm delivering the hottest water at all time. Whereas if I had ports coming at all these oddball places, I'd have to be thinking about dip tubes and how I'm piping it and how it stratifies. So go for simplicity. Try to try to make your systems work well. We're gonna transition now into some mechanical drawings. We have four mechanical drawings the three of us are gonna discuss. But before I do that, we just wanna remind everybody, we do have three handouts that you can download. Uh, one is number 27, which is again, air to water heat pump systems that Calafia has released, written I believe by Siggy. Uh, and then number 30 is a really good issue. It just talks about hydronics for low energy and net zero buildings. I know we have a lot of engineers and even some builders on this call, so grab both of those. And obviously when you download them, if you have any questions, reach out to me. You know, you can track me down on LinkedIn, you can track Max and Bob down. And at this point, we're actually just gonna segue away from this and we're gonna switch screens here. We're gonna start talking about uh, some of the systems here and uh, get some feedback from, from Bob and Max as we go. So these are not drawings that we did in particular for this. These are just drawings we use in general. I've probably got a few thousand drawings on my computer that we tweak and adjust for customers as needed. Um, so in this case, this is actually the drawing I, I did conceptually for my house. And so what you'll notice is the 57,300 BTUs over here, and you'll see that it's, it's 14 and a half gallons a minute, right? So again, this is where a lot of people go, why is that coming into play? But look at the lift on the equipment. This, this equipment isn't lifting the water 20 degrees and we don't care. And so this pump has to be sized accordingly. And the other thing that comes into play is that this piping has to be sized accordingly. We need to make sure that we try to keep that piping in a two to four feet per second range. We don't wanna be having really high flow velocities going through it. And if I was actually going and change this piping and turn it into some one inch piping, we're gonna find uh, that very quickly the head loss is gonna, or the flow velocity and head loss is gonna increase. At this point, I'm creeping up to almost six feet per second. And goodness forgive that if we put three quarter inch on this, which the math says for a boiler we could do, you can imagine what would happen here with flow velocity and, and everything else that comes into play. So on the secondary side, one of the things I want Bob to touch on here is we have some of the common things. We have a buffer tank and Again, it's that Argosys buffer tank where I've got supply and return. And on the secondary side, what we've done is I've, I've done what's called a short fat header. And, and Bob, I, I just want you to quickly touch on that and explain for people who don't understand because a lot of people would look at these pumps like this and go, wait a minute, Mike, these two pumps are gonna fight each other. Can you just sort of explain why that's not gonna happen in this scenario? Yeah, I mean, it's a, the whole concept of hydraulic separation. So that big tube on the bottom, that inch and a quarter copper pipe, you've got to add the flow of both those pumps when they're operating and make sure that that pipe that they're connected to, that supply header can uh, supply them both when they're running full speed, assuming maybe they're modulating pumps or something like that. But you got to be able to, um, you know, have the capacity there for both those pumps running. So one thing I will say, though, I'm going to try and talk Michael out of that piping on that buffer tank. There's a, a nicer way to pipe that, I think, for heat pumps, so we'll have that discussion. But um, may, I think you well, have a slide coming up on a, a direct to load and a three pipe, maybe. Yeah, the fun part is Bob has no idea what the drawings look like. So, Bob, good news. We've got a whole variety of options to talk about. Okay. So, in this particular scenario, where we're going with this is where I've highlighted, hopefully that shows clearly, we want to make sure that that flow velocity is, slow, is very low. Typically in a system like it, I'm gonna move over here, we wanna make sure we have turbulence here so we get good heat transfer, so we wanna be like two feet per second. Here we wanna drop that flow velocity below two feet per second so that this pump here and this pump here physically will not see each other or hydraulically compete with each other. The other nice part is if we drop this below two feet per second, we're gonna have laminar flow inside of that piping and that's actually good. It means there won't be as much heat transfer on that piping. So if it's copper, we don't have to worry about a radiator in the mechanical room. Um, this application with that tank you saw earlier, I'm happy with how this would be piped because I know the hottest water is going out. But to Bob's point, if you had a different style buffer tank, you don't actually know what water temperature you'd be delivering here. You could be delivering 80 degree water when your heat pump is actually putting out 120 degree water. And that's sort of where, where Bob is leading to. And good news is Bob, we got a drawing for that as well. So that's a that's a pretty simple setup. You know, we've got a DMF on it. We've got an air separator on it. Uh, we obviously have a properly sized expansion tank. The way that we control this typically is 
I don't care what the outdoor heat pump is doing. I'm not going to have any of the thermostats go back to the heat pump. The thermostats are going to monitor. All they're going to do is pull heat off this buffer tank, and my digital control will monitor that buffer tank and tell the heat pump to come on when the buffer tank needs it. I'm not running my thermostat controls directly back to that outdoor air to water unit. Um, moving on, we're going to do the next one that Bob and I both like, just so you feel better about it, Bob. So this is what Bob's talking about with direct to load. Do you want to just sort of explain what we're doing here with this piping? Yeah, so we've been in uh, hydronics for 19 maybe max. We did a, an issue on heat pump uh, or on buffer tanks, mainly for wood storage, but really for mod cons, anything. We talked about a two and a four pipe. Um, the, the issue I have with a four pipe is all the water has to cross the tank every time across the top and across the back. And anytime you move through a tank, you're gonna stir up that tank a little because unless those flows are exactly the same, there's gonna be movement in that tank from top to bottom. So you lose the ability to stratify the water. You lose the ability to really use the exergy of that tank 100% when you use a four pipe. So a two pipe um, is a way around that. What a two pipe does is you, um, you come out of the boiler, out of the heat pump and you go directly to low because I, if you look at the, come, come out of the heat pump to the tank, on that pipe there and highlight that or put your cursor on that one uh, on the bottom from the heat pump right over to the tank. Nope. Oh, right here. Yeah, right here. Uh, yep. That's your most precious water. Whatever the heat pump did to that water, that's the most precious. And you want to use that as quickly as and efficiently as possible. So you want to take that direct to the load. So if you've got a load that's coming on and the heat pump's running, there's no reason to go through the buffer tank if it can take all that uh, output of the boiler. So that's what direct to load is. So when we looked at that, we said, well, if a four pipe is good for certain conditions and can do this and that, the two pipe can do this. If you add the two together and average it, you come up with a three pipe. And what a three pipe does differently than a two or four is you go direct to load on the top, but on the bottom, you also have the coldest possible return going directly to the heat pump. It's not stirring the tank. It's not going through uh, the tank up and down this way. It's going straight across. So you're going to get your lowest possible temperature to keep your COP up or to keep your uh, modulating boiler efficiency, uh, your condensing up. And then you're going direct to load on the top. So you're taking that most precious, that water that you just paid to heat or cool, whatever condition it's in, and you're taking that directly to load without going across a tank where you're going to you're going to lose some of it going across of time because it's going to mix with something as it crosses through there so um, you know pros and cons to all of them there's you know there's different ways you can do it it's just again knowing the end goal and how efficiently you want to use that um, that energy that you just put into that stream of water for sure and the other thing that you can do is like right now you can see these are both match loads of 2.9 but if we put zone valves on this let's say this is only pulling a half a gallon a minute this direct to load still works because if we make sure that this piping right here coming off of the actual buffer tank is amply sized, what will end up happening is whatever needs to be drawn off here will naturally draw off and the remainder will end up going into that buffer tank and it will serve its purpose of decoupling the two systems. So obviously with any kind of buffer tank, if you've never piped it, whether it's two pipe, three pipe, four pipe, it's your first time doing it, reach out to somebody who's done it a few times so they can explain to you the ramification of, of what you're doing. The other thing to pay attention to, and, and Bob touched on this, is we want that tank stratified. So we wanna make sure we have the hot water at the top and the cold water at the bottom. So you know, if, if you're out there looking for a cheap buffer tank, I would tell you to stop, find a good buffer tank. And there's a few different ones that are out there that you can use. I know we have two that we like, one's a, a sun tank for solar applications. Uh, and the other one is the, the one that you saw before. And, and what I like about it is the ports are very high up on the top of the tank so that it makes it really easy to make sure that everything's going to work properly. Now, the other thing that we've got here is I just sort of scroll over. I just got to move my screen a little bit here uh, is we'll come over here and we will have a look at uh, a cooling. So this is a, a system and we've got two examples of this. So this is actually the situation in my own house. So this is an air to water doing heating and cooling with a backup boiler. So what's happening is we've got the air handler coming on before the buffer tank. And the logic behind that is my air handler is not modulating and cooling. It's a static fixed load that I don't have to worry so much about needing that buffer tank. And the other side that's nice about this is if this is a house where they want warm floors in the bathroom while they have cooling happening, which happens a lot, this is a piping configuration that's very easy to achieve that. So what happens in this control logic is that the staging control, which is basically just monitoring this tank from a heating standpoint, 
So if these loads call and if this tank doesn't have usable heat, and what I mean by that is if we design these radiant floor systems to need 120 degree water, this control can see the buffer tank is only 100 degrees, it'll bring the backup boiler, whether it's electric or, or gas or whatever it is, and instead of lifting the water from cold, it's lifting it from 100 degrees to 120 degrees. Now, there's a reason I have it on the secondary side of the system is because in my own application, we have time of use rates. I wanna make sure that I can charge this buffer tank off peak. I don't want the boiler charging my buffer tank. I wanna utilize the lowest possible fuel costs to charge that buffer tank. But again, this is my scenario. There are certainly scenarios where Bob or Max or others would go, this, this is not my scenario. This is not what I need. But this is a, a pretty typical control strategy we've done for the better part of a decade that works very, very well. Another way that we can do it is right here. And so, Bob, I'm gonna let you talk about this because I know you're quite familiar with this. Here, what we're doing is I've put a boiler. Now, this could have been solar thermal. It could be any energy source. And in this case, I'm actually tied in before the tank. You want to just sort of walk through the logic on that? Yeah, so then the you know the buffer tank can serve the, the ModCon boiler there. And where I would like to see that is if you have a micro loads, if you have loads that are smaller than what the turndown of the boiler is, then it's nice to have that, let's call it a battery is really what that buffer tank is. It's just gonna store that energy in there. So really what he's done on this two drawings is just move the, the boiler to the, you know, the left side of the buffer tank instead of the right side. So again, it, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. There isn't one that's necessarily better that you should do all the time than the other one. It's just, you know, what's the application and what's the um, what's the goal and how are we gonna maximize the efficiency of both the heat pump and the boiler? Is it gonna be going through the tank or on the downstream side of the tank? So you gotta just look at all the different pieces and, and find the best way to paste them together in a drawing, basically. And like yeah, so it's sort of there that if you have one zone so if you put in an air to water heat pump it would be very different than a house where you've got a towel rack and you might you know have a small bedroom you have seven different zones in the house that the buffer tank would be needed to sip off of that little battery you could pipe it completely different if you're just trying to do long run cycles but you only have one flow condition on the system side it's either the shop is on or the shop is off there's one pump going out there and that that determines you know how you navigate all these different buffer tank piping diagrams as well yeah mm -hmm. nice part about the i mean both are right as, as bob and, and max have both alluded to what i like about this is i know exactly what my system is doing i know that this tank is going to be at a certain set point and i know that all this boiler is doing is running when i need it this boiler actually does not come on when there isn't a heating call so this boiler is there's, there's a lot more to the control logic it's very simple it's off the shelf tech mark control there's nothing fancy about this but that boiler will never come on unless there is a heating call and this buffer tank does not have usable heat. And I, and I like that. The other thing that I like about it is I have the ability to charge this. So if you're in time of use, especially if you're in Ontario, because there's a lot of rumors of our electrical rates dropping significantly, well, I wanna make sure that when I have a really low cost of utility, that I charge this tank as hot as I can get it without hurting the heat pump, and then the boiler comes on. The other thing that comes into play, and, and Bob talked about this earlier about stratifying the tank, is if this boiler is on the left-hand side where the air handler is, where I showed it earlier, we have to be so careful that we don't have boiler water going back out to that heat pump because that will kill that heat pump. So on this side of the system, I like it. It's well protected, but either or is right. You know, Bob can make a great argument for the other way, and, and so can we. You know, it's nothing's right or wrong here. We're just trying to show you a bunch of different options so you can sort of see what comes into play. Um, we're gonna move on here. We did the direct to load. We've done that one. I wanna talk about this one. This, this drawing, I'm actually missing the return pipe, so I apologize for that. This is exactly the same. So we have an air to water heat pump feeding a buffer tank. And what's different here that I wanna touch on that's, that's not a good idea is it's closely spaced T's. So what's happening here is we're coming off this storage tank, we're feeding into the first one at 120 degrees, we are coming out at 100 degrees, going into the second one doing the exact same thing. So where we already have a bottleneck of how high we can lift that water temperature, we don't wanna be doing closely spaced T's because you'll get a temperature cascade across those T's. Now, it's not gonna be a matter of the first one was fed 120 and the next one gets 90. Like the first one will get 120 and we don't know what the second one's gonna get, none of us, you know, are, are doing that math. But the reality is 
we have firsthand experience where people have done this and done six manifolds with closely spaced T's on a heat bump, and that last zone on the coldest day may not get warm enough. So you could get phone calls of, why is my master bedroom cold? And the only thing that happened was closely spaced T's on that. Any any thoughts, guys? One yeah, of the other I mean, things that's hard to plan for there is like, how do you know, is zone one always on? Is it always taking 120 down to 100? Or does zone one come on only when the mother-in-law is in town? And then it, it it's just so hard to even know what to expect your temperature would be from a troubleshooting contractor standpoint. So how do you figure that out? How do you figure out that this heat emitter isn't working on zone six if it's all in series like this? Or if there's just realistically no potential for that to ever get warmer than 80 <laughs> degree supply temperature and you can't really know if there are zones that are on and off at different times. You don't know what to plan for. And again, just a little piping change on that tank and you could put your loads in parallel instead of series. Your loads are in series here. It's like the old Christmas tree lights. When you take one out, they all go out downstream of it. That's what happens when you put loads in series is that second load is gonna get a lower temperature than the first. If you want both to always have 120 degrees or whatever that shows there, then you need to put them in parallel, which you could do with the bottom header and um, just a little piping change. And maybe we need to do a buffer tank seminar because we could spend easily an hour on different ways to pipe um, these systems to, to maximize every one of them for every different application is really what we would like to show. Well, we, we call this three degrees because we look at at least three systems and we have three people talking about it. So I think we've got the topic for the next one. We'll do a three degrees on buffer tank. Yeah. The other thing to, to note here too is that when you're doing the closely spaced T's, you, you've got an extra pump you don't need. So if you sort of go back to the original drawing, which I think all of us would agree, whether it's it's this one or, or even the first one, I'm gonna go to the first one because it's cleaner. This is a simpler, cleaner, more cost-effective way to do it. I don't need a pump here. Everything gets the same load temperature. And the reality is that with boilers right now, if somebody calls and complains because it's on closely spaced tees that, hey, Max, the master bedroom isn't getting enough heat, well, Max is just gonna turn the boiler temperature up. And, then, and that's going to solve it. It's not great, but it beats repiping it. You can't do that on a heat pump. There is no going in and going, I'm just going to turn the temperature up and, and sort of hope for the best. So the last drawing that we wanted to sort of touch on here, and I'm just going to scroll down, is just more of a, uh, a buyer beware. And where I want to focus is on this side of the system. So what I've done is I've taken three heat pumps and I put them together. And I, I've intentionally left the flow velocities off so we can have a conversation about it. But the idea here being that this is going to be a short fat header. So this is size for under two feet per second so that these three units can't see each other. So you have to be very careful in doing this. So if this piping wasn't done properly and these were boilers, what would happen without check valves? Because you'll notice I've intentionally not put any check valves in here, is if one of these boiler or one of these boilers, if their boilers were running, the other ones could potentially be rats, right? You're we're actually going to be having flow going through them and they're gonna be rejecting heat into the space. If this is a heat pump application, what's gonna happen is if, if this unit is running and if we don't have check valves on this unit and this unit, we're actually going to cause oil migration from the compressor. It can potentially result in component failures. It's not a matter of I've, I'm just losing BTUs to the outdoor, it's actually a matter of we can cause equipment failure. So general principle we, we don't want to be doing this we want to be reverse returning the equipment it's it's a much smarter guaranteed way to make it work some some installers would prefer just to have one pump and do zone valves here me my own personal feeling is i like to have an individual pump per appliance because a small pump is easy for me to get at the hardware store just about anywhere if i have a problem if i put a giant grunfoss velo take or variable speed it could be a bit of a challenge max bob any any comments on multiple units thoughts Differences? Um, again, it's it's all in the piping. Yeah, I think just at a at a glance, it should look like a road going into the GTA, where you've got you know a big highway that's six lanes wide that turns into three two lane roads as it goes down. That's just kind of the principle to keep all the the cars moving well. Sometimes when you see in a, a picture on Instagram or whatever, and it's like a, a one inch copper manifold, and they've pulled you know t's of three quarter inch or whatever like a hundred times on that long skinny header it's like oh that's not that's that's not going to be helpful there so yeah that short fat is kind of a funny 
way to describe it, but that is, you know, just think of it like a road. It should be, you know, a bigger road funneling to the, the smaller roads as you go through, and that's what it should look like on a wall. Yeah, definitely with boilers, this wouldn't be such a big concern, but obviously with the applications with heat pumps, we want to pay attention. We want to make sure we're able to control them, but whether it's uh, it's this one here or, or the one that we all like where it's a direct to load, this is a very simple, clean installation. But to Bob's point, don't just go apply this with any buffer tank. This is a very specific buffer tank we've selected for this application, but this is the KISS method. I like that it's simple, it's clean. So whether we do this one or if we simply bypass that buffer tank as shown here, this is another excellent way to do it. Uh, and just again, be aware that if you have a cooling load, we wanna make sure as we make our way over to our cooling drawing, uh, we have to be very, very sure this application is great because it allows us uh, in this scenario to have heating in the buffer tank. So this buffer tank can be heated. This air handler can take care of cooling. But the other nice start about this is you don't ever have to worry about, hey, did I accidentally put chilled water into this radiant floor? There's pretty much no opportunity for this tank to get charged with cold water. And then we start having issues with dew point and, and sweating that's happening in the floor. Any Great. final thoughts, guys? No, I think we covered a lot of ground there, and uh, yeah, it's uh, there's no no single drawing that's going to make it happen. So that's where uh, you know, the Eden Energy team can help point you in the right direction of okay, what's what's your objective? How many zones are we talking about? What type of you know, goals do we have for the homeowner, and and work through those details individually. How about you, Bob? Yeah, I mean, if you're going to buy high efficiency equipment, make sure you're piping it and controlling it so it can be high efficiency equipment to run anything, a boiler or heat pump out of its comfort zone, so to speak. You're not selling that customer what you promised them is high efficiency, which, you know, like I said earlier, the cost of gas isn't going to go down. So whatever the equipment is, you want to use it to the best of its ability. So it's the design, it's the installation, it's the pipe sizing, it's a control, it's everything uh, has to be looked at as a big picture for every job. You can't rubber stamp these, which is why you saw so many different uh, piping schematics there. You got to pick the right one for the application. Yeah, and I, I think Bob said it best. I mean, at the end of the day, you, you need a design and, and Max touched on it as a supplier. We provide free designs with every piece of equipment we sell because we don't want to die. <laughs> we we want to make sure you install it successfully, but even with the design, you have to understand the design and the application. Um, you know, it's really important that we, we pay attention to what we're doing and understand that technology is changing. Um, if you have any questions after this training, by all means, shoot me an email, look me up on Instagram or LinkedIn, look these two guys up. We're, we're always happy to answer a question. It's literally what we get paid to do. Uh, I've got the 800 number up there. So if you ever want to talk to our technical team and, and figure out what's happening, our team is great. They love to help and they'd be willing to do that for you. Uh, if you missed the previous episodes of Three Degrees of Hydronic Design, they are on Eden Energy's YouTube channel. So if you go on YouTube and look up Eden Energy Equipment, you'll find the three of us talking. You'll find me and Robert Bean, John Siegenthaler. It's, we do a lot of training. Obviously, look up Kalefi on YouTube. The Coffee with Kalefi series is fantastic. It's, it's similar to what we do, but also quite different, which is great. Um, there were some questions on how do we get a link to the recording. I think I might have just answered that. If you go to YouTube, you can see most of the past trainings that we've done. As far as trainings going forward, I think we just decided we're gonna do another three degrees, maybe in a month or two on buffer tanks. That'll be fun, we'll get into the weeds on that. Uh, that'll, that'll kill an hour easy. Uh, Eden Energy, we have Dr. Allison Bales coming up next Wednesday and Thursday to do building science training, so envelope training. Uh, pretty excited about that. We've got uh, Siggy coming up uh, in April, and we've got a whole pile of in-person heat pump training in our live fire lab. So. Certainly want to thank everybody for coming. And obviously I want to thank Max and Bob for taking the time to join me for this. And we appreciate everybody being here. Thanks everybody. Yeah, thanks Michael. Thanks everyone. All right, thanks, see guys. you soon.